The NFL's preference to maximize safety and limit danger poses the greatest threat to America's most popular sport. It's a far more damaging initiative than the league's promotion of Black Lives Matter and anti-American sentiment. People watch football because we're entertained by seeing men flirt with danger in pursuit of a goal. Football is far less entertaining than it was 20 years ago before an onslaught of rules changes softened the game and demonized hard hits. Yesterday's Atlanta-Tampa Bay game was ruined when referee Jerome Bolger flagged a Falcons defensive lineman for a routine sack of Tom Brady. The roughing the passer penalty cost Atlanta any chance of a comeback. Safety is a woman's priority. Men seek thrills and danger. Feminizing football is a mistake. Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, uh, your host. Happy Monday to you and yours. Uh, I hope you guys had an awesome, great weekend. I did. I went to Knoxville over the weekend and spoke at a fast, laugh, no, what is, fight, laugh, feast uh, conference for Chocolate Knox and the guys at Cross Politics. Enjoyed my trip out to Knoxville. I also made a huge, huge decision that I tried to share on Instagram earlier today, and then I got a phone call and got kicked off. Uh, but notice what's missing from my left ear. My, after 20 plus years of wearing a earring, I kicked my habit over the weekend. And it has to do with what I was talking about. This whole feminization of football ha has made me so irritated and so sick and tired of the direction we're going. I said, you know what? I'm tossing my earring away. I, I just, I don't want anybody to mistake me for one of these feminized men we got running around now. And, and <laughs> that earring, it's funny, TJ, and TJ Moe's here with me in studio. I, that earring is probably worth $9,000. I bought it um, in Las Vegas. I won a bunch of money in Vegas shooting craps, and I didn't want to blow the money back, and so I went out and bought an earring and bought some other stuff. And, and, but again, that was probably 10 years ago. I've worn other earrings before that. But anyway, I, t I took this earring out, and now I don't care. I almost tossed it in the trash, literally. <laughs> I, I'm just that frustrated and embarrassed with myself. So uh, no more earrings for Jason Whitlock. There you go. I like I'm, it. I'm, I'm very pleased and happy with myself. Uh, anyway, I have an awesome show. We have an awesome show planned for you today. TJ Moe is here with us in studio. It's Monday. We're going to review the NFL. Uh, that means Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell, is going to be here. That means Jason Brown, Last Chance Q, as I like to call him. You guys know him from the documentary, the Netflix documentary, Last Chance U. Uh, you're going to get the best breakdown of the NFL weekend from us right here, me, TJ Moe, Steve Kim, and Jason Brown. Uh, but before we get into all that, and I do have a great fire starter for us, uh, but before I get into that, I want to take this moment uh, before we start talking football and start talking about my friends over at Preborn. Almost one out of every five Americans never have a chance to live outside the womb because of abortion. It's the leading cause of infant death in the world. Over 63 million babies have been aborted just since Roe v. Wade was enacted, and a lot more will be aborted in its wake. The Ministry of Preborn and Blaze Media are partnering to help rescue 50,000 babies from abortion in 2022. They're working to put Planned Parenthood out of business by providing free ultrasounds to expecting mothers. 80% of the time, hearing that baby's heartbeat is enough to convince the mother to keep her baby. And when she chooses life, Preborn provides maternity and baby clothes and diapers and car seats and counseling and everything a woman needs to get through that pregnancy and get to the other side of that pregnancy, and they do it free of charge. That's their level of commitment to the preservation of life. Preborn 
has a passion to save unborn babies from abortion and see women come to Christ. Over the past 15 years, preborn centers have counseled over 450,000 women considering abortion and nearly 190,000 of them have saved their babies. Will you help us rescue babies' lives? To donate, dial pound 250, say the keyword baby, that's pound 250, keyword baby, or you can simply go to preborn.com slash fearless. Uh, I was in Knoxville this weekend. I was very pleased. A gentleman came up to me and there was probably 1,200 people at this uh, conference in Knoxville. A gentleman came up to me and said, Jason, I gave to Preborn. Seeing you give up your money online to support this cause provoke me to do the same. And so I hope that I'm compelling many of you to get involved in this fight uh, with Preborn. Preborn.com slash fearless or pound 250, say the keyword baby. That's how you can help save a baby's life. Do it. Do it because you're a good fearless soldier. Do it because you want me to do a great show and give you more great fire starters like the one I'm about to do right now. All right, uh, that's the business I need to take care of. Now let's get down to business. Uh, we used to understand that not everything is for everybody. We no longer do. We live in the era of unisex bathrooms. In the name of inclusion, we killed Boy Scouts to make room for girls. We expanded marriage. We bought the lie that everything is for everybody. We embrace the myth that we can have it all. Truth is, we can't. Our collective pursuit of everything undergirds America's decline. Pat Riley, the NBA legend, calls it the disease of more. A team wins a championship and every member of the organization wants more for themselves, eventually destroys the team. The quest for more eventually changes the character of the pursuer. He or she loses life balance and compromises core values in the hunt for more. In my opinion, the disease of more explains Tom Brady's rumored divorce. Tom's gonna find out you can't have it all. It's a lesson that the NFL will soon learn. The National Football League, America's favorite form of entertainment, wants to have it all. Under the weak leadership of Commissioner Roger Goodell, the NFL has spent the last 15 years pursuing corporate media-defined inclusion. A sport intended to groom young boys and men to compete in a meritocracy has bowed to the feminist worldview of diversity, inclusion, and equity. The NFL strives to be everything for everybody. The push for inclusion has caused the league to prioritize safety. Safety is a woman's priority. Men seek thrills and danger. We're not sadistic. We're just made differently by design. Our love of danger leads to progress and advancement. Men called roughnecks built skyscrapers in the 1920s. You hear me talk about it on this show. Watch this clip. It's not just me. History has recorded this. The working men who construct the buildings, known as roughnecks, are a special breed. They work without harnesses, safety ropes, or hard hats, spending eight-hour shifts in the clouds with no bathroom breaks. Workers fling red-hot rivets by hand through the air. These jobs are so dangerous that two out of five fall to their deaths or end up disabled. Did you hear that? Roughnecks, building skyscrapers. 40% of them fell to their deaths or disablement. Women would have never built skyscrapers. They prioritize safety. The NFL's preference to maximize safety and limit danger poses the greatest threat to America's most popular sport. It's a far more damaging initiative than the league's promotion of Black Lives Matter and anti-American sentiment. People watch football because we're entertained by seeing men flirt with danger in pursuit of a goal. Football is far less entertaining 
than it was 20 years ago before an onslaught of rules changes softened the game and demonized hard hits. Yesterday's Atlanta-Tampa Bay game was ruined when referee Jerome Boger flagged a Falcons defensive lineman for a routine sack of Tom Brady. The roughing the passer penalty cost Atlanta any chance of a comeback. On Miami's first offensive play against the New York Jets, officials monitoring the game removed quarterback Teddy Bridgewater because he allegedly briefly staggered when getting to his feet after a routine hit. Bridgewater was not allowed to return to the game. Facing Miami's third string quarterback, the Jets won in a romp. The Brady and Bridgewater plays are a direct result of the Tua Tungviola controversy two weeks ago. Tua, who is fragile, suffered brief paralysis after a routine hit. Without a shred of evidence, broadcasters and social media influencers connected Tua's brief paralysis to a hit he suffered four days earlier. Broadcasters demonized the Dolphins organization and the team's head coach for allowing Tua to play. The NFLPA demanded an investigation and then worked with the NFL to enact immediate new rules related to concussion protocols. Those new rules are why Bridgewater disappeared yesterday after one play. We all want football to be safe. When it's not safe, we want to blame somebody. The problem is the game isn't meant to be safe. It's meant to be dangerous and entertaining. People are going to get hurt. It's inevitable. It's no different from boxing or mixed martial arts. It's no different from working on a skyscraper in the 1920s. The NFL won't make this argument because the league wants to be all things to all people. It wants to avoid upsetting women and men who have been feminized to the point that they might as well be women. But check out this clip of Dominique Foxworth to get what I'm talking about. It's frustrating to me to listen to and read fans and, and media and everyone being all up in arms. Um, we all got to take responsibility. And I think Mike McDaniel in that press conference, he should have taken responsibility. Don't pretend like you out here um, protecting all the players. Take responsibility for the role that you played in that. And Swagoo is taking responsibility for not raising more noise before that. He's taking responsibility. All of us and the fans in particular need to take responsibility because it's not just these ugly hits that are a problem. Like every weekend that there is football played, there are players out there who shake hands afterwards and feel fine, but they have gotten closer to having some sort of long-term issue or having some sort of CTE. So we all understand that. We accept that. And what frustrates me is all these people, fans in particular, pretending like they give a damn about Tua or they give a damn about football players all of a sudden. When we're in these collective bargaining meetings and we're arguing, for, to not have Thursday games after Sunday games, to have a bye, to not have a 17th game season, arguing to increase the pay of players because the risk of this game is so damn high, there are not fans up there fighting and throwing themselves all in a tizzy <laughs> on Twitter because of that. They're yelling at us, then like, no, get back and play football. So just keep that same damn energy. You give a damn about Tua now, give a damn about all the rest of the players in the off season when we're trying to fight to have a second opinion. We have to give up percentage points of our salary cap in order to force the teams to give our players a second opinion in doctors. And don't nobody give a damn when we're doing that. Uh, <laughs> the NFL fears moms, women who want to let their sons play football because the sport is too dangerous. They, they're the same women who won't let their kids go to school without wearing a mask. They're women who want to remove all the risk from life. Women in beta males desire for all of us to sit in our homes playing video games, communicating over social media, watching 50-year-old Queen Latifah beat up men in the Equalizer TV series, and waiting for our next booster shot. They want us all to transition into women. You know what, their plan is working. I've watched football for 50 years. I turned off my television when I saw Tua momentarily have his fingers disfigured and paralyzed. I briefly lost my appetite for football. That has never happened before. It speaks to the impact of the football concussion propaganda. I'll watch someone get knocked out in the ring or an octagon and jump for joy. But we've been programmed to see violence in football as savage and gruesome. 
15 years ago, Chris Berman and Tom Jackson could react to the NFL big hits the way Joe Rogan and Daniel Cormier still do at UFC events. We've all, we all still allow to enjoy seeing fighters get put in the concussion protocol. It's socially unacceptable to enjoy it on a football field. We pretend that the grossly exaggerated CTE pandemic only affects football players. We've been feminized. We've been programmed to prioritize our emotions and feelings over logic and fact. We no longer know when, how, and where we should feed and support man's innate desire to take risks. We've been convinced that swiping left and right on Tinder is a better venue for risk taking than a football field. More kids will, will be permanently and severely damaged in a hospital operating room undergoing gender affirming surgery than playing football. You get my point? The very people trying to make the world safer are actually making it more dangerous. Football isn't for women. Trying to make the game more palatable for women is a mistake. It's how you end up with Arizona quarterback Kyler Murray showing up to work on Sunday wearing a lime green Hillary Clinton pants suit. Among other things, feminized football turns men into runway models. That is my fire. Uh, Korean Cosell, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, glad to have you. Uh, TJ Mo here with us in studio. Uh, what do you think of my contention, and we'll start with you, Cosell, uh, my contention that the NFL is trying too hard to please women? I think that's a part of it. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I, I think it is the outrage mob and the cancel woke culture that they are trying to codify, uh, in my view. Look, when, when you get into certain jobs, whether it's coal mining, uh, doing construction jobs or a thousand feet in the air or playing football or being a prize fighter, everyone knows what they are getting into. You are not drafted into this. Now, in the National Football League, you are drafted into an organization, but no one is theoretically forcing you to play. Now, maybe your circumstances and your socioeconomic factors force you to play this dangerous game. But I think for a very long time, most young men that take up this endeavor love the game of football. Now, over a course of time, it may turn into a business, which it is, but there's an acceptable amount where you could say, you know what? As Ray Robinson once said after a fatality in one of his fights, and they said, well, this sport is very dangerous and people can get hurt. And Mr. Robinson said as only he could, sir, I'm in the hurt business. There's a reality to it. You can make the game safer. You could cleanse it a little bit. But the truth of the matter is it's a violent endeavor. And I've even seen it in boxing where nowadays, if you get hit too much in the middle of a round, at the end of the round, instead of getting your one minute rest, now you have doctors coming in, calling a timeout, extending the, the uh, rest period. And here's the problem. You might actually extend the beating. If you, got, if you give a guy another 30 seconds in between a round, maybe that guy lasts three more rounds that he shouldn't. And, and I've seen this in the National Football League. There came a point about a decade ago, Jason and TJ, they outlawed certain hits. And here's what happened, and you can ask Rob Gronkowski about this. The target area started to lower, guys started getting their knees taken out. You talk to a lot of players, and it's not popular to say anymore, they tell you they would rather take a blow above the chest than below the thigh. Uh, and they only play the game. But, you know, that Tom Brady hit was very interesting. It got me thinking, and I know you and me, Jason, are on the same wavelength when it comes to this. This game has changed so much that you almost have to judge players differently from this modern era to what it was. I go back to Joe Montana, who in my mind still is the greatest quarterback ever, not because of the number of rings or anything else. He played in an era where quarterbacks were still football players. The two most violent hits I think I've ever seen on a quarterback was one was in the 86 divisional uh, playoffs against the Giants. Jim Burt bounced Joe Montana off the air, it, it looked like Jazzy Jeff when Uncle Phil would throw him out of the house. Nowadays, Jim Burt would not only get flagged, he'd get suspended, might get arrested for assault. And then the 1990 championship game, Leonard Marshall from the blind side on his third effort 
just absolutely hammered Montana to a point they could have put a chalk line out on the field of Candlestick Park, and it essentially ended his 49er run. He was out the whole year. And you know what? Neither play was dirty. I'm getting the sense now, guys. Jack Lambert once said years ago famously, what do I think of quarterbacks? Put a dress on them. Okay, maybe we can't do that. Maybe we should just put flags on them and play flag football as it relates to pass rushing. Trying too hard to please, woman. Yes. Um, now, the, there, is, there is some strategy behind this. Between 2008 and 2018, the youth football participation, age 6 to 18, lost 25% of their workforce, for lack of a better word. Right? Uh, high school football is below 1 million kids for the first time since 1998. So mm -hmm. it is dropping. Now, the question is, is it dropping because the NFL won't fight back, or is it dropping because of you know, the, all the lawsuits and the idea of the CTE propaganda, which is what it is, right? Because if you know the background of this CTE nonsense, it comes from one study commissioned in 2012. They studied like 101 brains donated from people who were like, I'm pretty sure this guy was crazy. And they said 97% of those guys, turns out they were crazy. And so they say, you know, I bet all football players have CTE. And you're like, well, you didn't study any of the healthy guys, and you didn't study any women's soccer team, and you didn't study any women who never played sports or any local accountants. How do you know everyone doesn't have a level of whatever this is that you're making up? And so a lot of it is propaganda. You've scared these women instead of the NFL saying, this is a violent sport, but this is the safest you can make a violent sport, and we're definitely not cracking until you get us some better information than that garbage. Instead of that, they say, you know what, you're right. This is a terribly violent sport. What we'll do is we'll cover everybody with bubble wrap, we'll make it a, an unwatchable sport, and um, we're really sorry. And I'm telling you, eight-year-old TJ would not recognize this game. When I was eight years old, that was 1998. My favorite player at the time was John Lynch, who wouldn't be in the league today. He's an NFL Hall of Famer that wouldn't have existed. If I turned on today's thing, I'd say, what are they, why are they pushing everybody out of bounds? Why are they just pulling people down? What happened to my favorite player whose job it was to break collarbones? That's what made little TJ fall in love with football. I wouldn't recognize it today. It's, it's not as good a product. I, I, look, the, the league, I think, has a reason to some degree to feel bulletproof particularly after surviving the Black Lives Matter fiasco and they still got the stuff on the uh, field, the end racism stuff. And, the, and again, these are all like sentiments. Who could be against ending racism? Uh, and, and so, it's, but it's a joke. And it's like, let's end air. Let's end, uh, you know, let's end, just put end cancer in there. You know, any of these things that are, go ahead. That's the societal version of, hey, you still beat your wife. I mean, <laughs> how are you supposed to really answer that? <laughs> Talk about a catch-22 question, right? I mean, geez. Yeah, but, but they, they have survived that. The whole anti-American sentiment and the people not liking the players, uh, they've survived that and probably feel more bulletproof today <clears throat> than at any time because it's like, Colin Kaepernick turned this league upside down, pissed on all our fan base, pissed on 30 years of marketing that Pete Rozelle had built the league up using. But I think this feminization of the sport and the removing of, of the violence, the competitive violence, is a real threat. The product and, and the belief that we're seeing the ultimate competition is being undermined and it's just not as compelling uh, w without, without, the, without the knockout shots. I'm sorry, it's just not as compelling. But Jason, I, I will counter that. As long as you have fantasy football and gambling, the National Football League across five networks, it's still the number one rated television show. And there's still something, my favorite weekends of the year are not when I cover a fight, not at least anymore. Um, it's not even when I go to a football game, which I did this weekend in Miami. Uh, I actually love it. On a Saturday morning at about 7.30, I wake up to watch ESPN game day, and then I watch 14 hours of college football on three or four different screens at a time, and then the next day watch another 10 to 12 hours of National Football League action, and then Monday. I've told you this before. Starting from Thursday on, that's when my weekends begin, right around Labor Day weekend, I'll watch about 30 to 35 hours of football. 
I think there's a lot of people like me that don't like what the sport is becoming, are frustrated by some of the new rules and regulations, but it's still incredible, compelling television. I mean, Jason, we have to look at the facts. Do I think that that summer of George Floyd overreaction was good for the league? No. But if you actually look at the television ratings right now, there's still nothing else in terms of the athletic realm that comes close to the ratings of the National Football League. And I, But if you look, look at the Pro Bowl, guys. The Pro Bowl became unwatchable. I grew up in an era where a week after the Super Bowl, they'd go to Honolulu, I think it was called the Hula Bowl, and every player played that game that was selected short of an injury. It was an honor, and guess what, guys? They really hit one another. The last 15 years, that game has devolved into two-hand touch. It was unwatchable, but guess what? Look at the actual ratings. It did better ratings than just about any other live sporting event. So I'm just telling you, the National Football League, I hate to say it, Jason, I think is in a protected realm where no matter what product they put out, guys like me, we still can't get enough. I, I get the ratings for the Pro Bowl remain solid, relatively speaking, but they did cancel it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, and so they shouldn't have. That to me, well, well I, I'm not oh, sure. I think they should have. I think it was it, a terrible product. Yeah, it, it's, it's <laughs> literally, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, yeah, and, and I think over the long haul, they canceled it before the ratings finally evaporated. They, right. they could tell which way it was trending, and, and rather than take the PR hit, just end it <laughs> now. Uh, b because it's just, I, people tune in to watch great competition, That's right. and, and the competition isn't nearly as great. And I'll tell you, I didn't get into this in my mono or in my column, but the game is so much easier to manipulate now. Yeah. And eventually these same people that are addicted to the gambling and the fantasy football, which is just another form of gambling, they're gonna start to lose belief that this is authentic competition. Because you know how easy it would be to fix a game right now if you're a quarterback, a way that could never be questioned? Just stagger for a moment on the field. Mm -hmm. Take a hit and just stagger for a moment. Get yourself pulled out of the game. Teddy Bridgewater, and again, there's no proof that he even really staggered because I don't think they never could really show the video. But Teddy Bridgewater being pulled out of the game, the Jets won in a blowout yep. because they were down to the third string quarterback. In any co if I'm, take Geno Smith. Is it, did I get the name? Is it the last name Smith? Mm -hmm. Gino, the quarterback in Seattle, uh, he hasn't made the mega millions. He, he, the, he never got a Kyler Murray type contract. So if someone offered him the right kind of payday to just take a stagger on the field, the rules will dictate that you can't finish playing that game, Seattle gets crushed. They, they, they don't, is Drew Locke their backup quarterback? Yes. Or I can't remember. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I just I think eventually they're going to erode trust <laughs> in the competition of the league, and and because I'm t Jerome Bolger's call, I want an investigation of him. Oh, yes. Everybody wants everybody <laughs> wants uh, the Dolphins investigated for how they handled Tua. I want an investigation of Jerome Bolger. How do you make that call? Did we see the highlights? Because they actually did a good job during the broadcast of saying, here's all the times he's been hit today. Didn't call this, didn't call this, got hit yeah. below the, the waist, didn't call this, threw him down. And then they showed the easiest one. And it, they said, and that, here's the one that decided the game. So as it relates to what you were saying about uh, surviving Black Lives Matter, right? That didn't change the product. The product has always overcome. This changes the product. And it's like, if this goes the way of the Pro Bowl, um, and it becomes to where we, we're, we're just not going to touch quarterbacks anymore. This is two-hand touch, which is already what it is, and they'll just start telling the truth about it. You can't hit above the head. You can't hit below the legs. You're getting too many ACLs. So all you can do is just push people down right at their waist. People aren't going to watch it. Boxing, at one point, was the greatest sport in the world to watch. And there's not that many people watching anymore. Right? So Yeah, you know, TJ, I, I, I think I, the Go ahead. The problem with boxing is it, it went to cable premium networks about 30 years ago and you eroded the audience. Football is still on a network, so I think it's a little bit different. I think the boxing product at the high level is still good. The problem is most of your good fighters simply don't fight enough. And the, the National Football League actually said, you know what, and this is the hypocrisy of the safety issue, you know what, football is so dangerous, guys, we're going to add one more game. 
I mean, just think about that. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of the, the, the whole Lawrence, uh, the Boger call, uh, here's the thing. Jason, Jerome Boger. Yeah, okay. Jerome, yeah, Romy Rome. You're right, Jason. The new fixing or shaving <laughs> points is the, instead of just like dropping a pass or, or flubbing one, you could just tell a guy, hey, ahem, you owe some money. It's okay. You're getting a concussion today, kid. See, I mean, really, Jason, you brought it about. You're right. Hey, kid, tonight uh-huh. we got the points. You're getting a concussion. You know, stagger off a little bit. You're good. The other thing is I remember a time, and, Jason, I'm sure you remember this game, a guy that we brought up a lot recently, Rich Gannon. And I think this was the beginning of that rule. Tony Siragusa, I think it was the divisional playoffs of 2000 when that great Ravens defense made that run. Um, in the second quarter of that game, Siragusa – sacks Rich Gannon or hits him right after the pass, and the goose just lifted him up, put him underneath his body, and just slammed him. And I remember thinking, wow, that's real football. That's real football. The problem with what they're doing with defenders today is they're asking these big men who move very fast to make split-second decisions and asking them almost to defy the laws of gravity and physics. My my view is this. If you're going to have that type of safety – in place to make the Dominic Foxworthies or Foxworthies happy. I guess the fans are not to blame for this one now, right? I, I would just make the college rule then. In college, if there's a targeting call, every single one of them is reviewed, goes upstairs, and a lot of times, to their credit, they rescind the call. If you're going to be that safety-minded about protecting quarterbacks, why not put that protocol in place? I, I, I want to make, and that's a good point. I, I want to make, I'm going to skip ahead to and, and combine this topic with something we're going to talk about as it relates to Kyler Murray. And, and, and when Kyler Murray, did, if you saw him show up to work yesterday in the lime green pantsuit, and, 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 and I say this in all seriousness, people are going to think I'm joking, exaggerating. That, that I'm making too much of it. But if football were still football, you wouldn't show up to work dressed like this mm. because you would be showing like, man, I'm stepping into a real danger zone and I better be locked in. My mindset has to be right for this war that I'm about to go into. But this guy knows he's going into a protected bubble, a protected space. And so it's almost like a joke. And so he's got time to think in the morning, hey, what kind of feminized Queen Elizabeth pantsuit can I wear on the runway uh, before I go play a football game? No, I'm just that when you're preparing to play football in previous eras, I'm just telling I don't think anybody would think to put that on. Unless, now, perhaps if they're closeted, they would put that on, and, and maybe Kyler is. I don't know. Uh, but I, I just, this to me, what's going on with Kyler Murray and why they're having to try to put clauses in to study the game, it's not real anymore to these guys. It's not hyper competitive, and so they're not locked in or as committed. And look, guys struggle with you know, how seriously they take football in a game all the time. But at 40 some odd million dollars a year, when you're tasked with playing a game that used to be violent, I just don't think you wake up in the morning thinking, <laughs> what, what pantsuit am I going to put on? And but I, I get, this whole feminizing <laughs> of sports and football, it has a trickle down effect that, that impacts everybody. And that's a reason why this clown uh, slid on third down a yard short of the first down because he ain't getting hit. He's out here in this protected space in this bubble. Again, that wouldn't happen 20 years ago no way. because all of his teammates would. Hey, man, we needed a yard, and you, you know, blah. And then because he's not locked in, that's why he got up and spiked the football. Yeah. And again, you can blame that on the coach. If, if you want as well, but quarterbacks are paid to think and understand the game. And let's say the coach is giving you the wrong instructions. I, get, I don't want to make too much of it, and this will sound like I'm going Al Bundy here, but I can remember in a seventh grade football game, my coach wanting to call a timeout uh, when we were trying to 
uh, minimize how many time ups and saving for the end of the game. I was the captain of the team. I shook him off in seventh grade, like, no, we ain't calling a timeout. <laughs> and it was the right, he thanked me afterwards. We saved time. We ended up winning the game or whatever. But if I can think to do that as a seventh grade football player, I'm an NFL quarterback playing millions of dollars. And in that moment, I couldn't think, hey, we shouldn't be spiking this ball. Kyler Murray's a clown, and it's because football allows him to be. Don't blame uh, Cliff Kingsbury. He put it in his contract that he needed to be studying football. I mean, <laughs> truly, these guys know this. You know, I make an analogy here. Uh, Kyler Murray may be turning into Russell Westbrook. He may Uh-oh. be the guy who's uber talented, Mr. Triple Double, put up some good stats, and he's never going to be the guy because he doesn't know how to take things quite as seriously as he should. Now, Russell's very selfish, different kind of deal. But this is how Russell shows up to every game. Cam Newton. Cam Newton. That's who I think of. Yep. Is, he's short Cam Newton. So, <clears throat> to, to, to your point about um, how seriously these guys take it, I saw a clip um, the two weeks ago. It happened this year. And it was of Tom Brady who – took a snap, was turning around to go to play action, Leonard Fournette's behind him. As he's turning around, he says, cover two. And he's telling Leonard Fournette what he needs to be doing on that play, assuming he may not get it, I need him to be in the right spot and whatever. He's coaching in the middle of a play as it's going on. Can you ever imagine Kyler Murray coaching? He's not coaching himself, right? Coaching somebody else to make sure the play goes exactly right. Maybe he knew that Leonard struggled with a certain read or whatever. He was just telling him what to do and exactly where to go in the middle of a play. Kyler, not, not only does he not know the offense, which I'm sure we'll get into with JB here in a little bit, but he doesn't know the rules of football well enough to manipulate the game to give himself a chance to win. Steve. Yeah, a couple things. As I saw Kyler Murray walking in, I got a couple thoughts on this. For some reason, I was craving a, a, a stick of spearmint gum. Now, the other thing is, you know, I, I caught the good old days of teams walking off their planes in army fatigues. Uh, my view is this. As a football coach, especially in college, or even as a pro if I could do it, I would give a team a set of, of a sweatsuit. Wear that. I want you focused on the game. I want you wearing our team colors. You don't have to go off the cover of GQ or something from Versace. This is not a fashion show. This is one of my problems with Kyler Murray. Are you trying to be cool or are you trying to be good? I think Burrow, Joe, Joey Football has fallen into that. But a lot of this, I kind of blame David Stern. Remember 25, 30 years ago, Jason, he didn't like the fact Allen Iverson actually showed up to a basketball game in, I don't know, basketball jerseys and a lot of jewelry. I kind of miss that because once it began that, hey, we have to dress as businessmen, well, again, be careful what you ask for. All these guys started looking at I think social media has something to do with this because nowadays they show these guys coming into the locker room. This is a part of their quote unquote brand showing off their, I think it's called the drip from the younger folks. So now guys, they actually do game plan for their wardrobe. Again, let's get back to the good old days. Wear your street clothes, wear your starter jacket, wear whatever jewelry you want. In fact, you know what? Wear a tank top for all I care. You're here to play a game of football. This is not a fashion show. You're not going to a Fortune 500 boardroom meeting, but this is all a part of it. And, and TJ, to your point, uh, I, I do think that even last night, though, the good news is Kyler Murray had a marathon session of playing Donkey Kong or Miss Pac-Man. I'm sure he had a great time at home for about eight, nine hours. <laughs> I'm going to go and cut deeper. I'm going to go and cut deeper, though, Steve. This is, all these guys have wardrobe handlers or stylists. Yes. Stylists. They all have stylists. And they're, uh, people, stylists are paying them. Fashion designers are paying them. Yes. And we've turned the NBA showing up into a runway. Now we've turned the NFL into showing up. It's a runway. These guys see themselves as runway model, and they're probably getting paid to show off these different fashions and style. And it, it's it's they're stylists a lot. And, and this is like it, it's an overall thing about who's in charge Jason, of fashion. Go, go ahead. And Jason, to be fair, Michael Jordan in that era uh, wore a lot of suits, but it was business. It, it was very yeah. stylish, but it was very masculine. Some of these outfits, well, let me just say this, not masculine. And so so when Michael Jordan stepped into a venue along with Scottie Pippen, I remember Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin used to be dressed, but it was very masculine, very stylish, but it was traditional, classical suits. No one was wearing 
a dress pants or whatever. I mean, Russell Westbrook is flat out worn like a skirt, and you're thinking, oh, God. So I think there's a difference. Yes, you can have a business mindset as you gear up for a game because how you look is going to impact how you play because if you look good, feel good, play good, as Deion Sanders says. So there is a mindset to this. But when I saw Kyler Murray uh, looking like a big piece of spearmint bubblegum, I said, what the hell are you focused on? I, I just, again, it's, I'm old. I don't get it. It's get off Cam my Newton. Lawn, you kid. Yes. It's, it's Cam Newton all over again. Cam started showing up in a bonnet, and that I was very <laughs> critical of that. And again, the whole fashion industry is dominated by the Alphabet Mafia. These guys have stylists that are part of the Alphabet Mafia. That's who's laying out their clothes, and they wonder why they show up looking like feminized clowns. It's because you're stylists. That's how he wants you to look. He's paid to make you look feminized, or you got a female stylist who's dressing you like a woman. Uh, and and it, it is what it is. It's just it, these guys are doing it for the money. They don't understand how they're being manipulated. And, and the, the whole country, it's not just football that's going down this path, but they're the tastemakers, the influencers. They're the ones that are making it okay, seem cool to get every kid and there's, hey, what, what, what lime green uh, Hillary Clinton pantsuit can I wear to school tomorrow? It's all part of the gimmick. I want to move on to the Cowboys. Uh, they won again with Cooper Rush. They've won four straight games with Cooper Rush. Uh, there will be people talk about a quarterback controversy. I don't think they have a quarterback controversy at all. Dak Prescott, to me, is better than Cooper Rush. Dak Prescott's not worth the 40 some odd million dollars they're paying him, but he's better than Cooper Rush. The real story is the Dallas' defense basically makes the quarterback irrelevant and, and so I'm asking both of you the question. Uh, we'll start with TJ. Does, the quarter, does it matter who plays quarterback in Dallas? This defensive front and this defensive team they put together uh, makes it irrelevant. They, they can be, it's like Tampa Bay when Brad Johnson led them to a Super Bowl. Just, the quarterback just don't get in the way. <clears throat> well, that could be the issue, right? Because um, Trent Dilfer is another example there, yeah. right? Um, if you're prone to turnovers, which I haven't looked too much at the stats for Dak, but if you're prone to turnovers or, or you think you're the $40 million quarterback who needs to prove his worth, you put this really good defense in precarious positions. Cooper Rush is not doing that. He's trying to get short completions. He's trying to not lose the game as the backup quarterback. That's what he's been instructed to do. He's probably more co coachable at this time. He's probably a guy that communicates a little bit more nicely with his teammates because he's not dictating them from the ivory tower of your $40 million contract. I actually think the pressure is less for this offense which oftentimes puts you in a position to succeed when you have a dominant defense at this point in time I'm not sure they would be in the position they are if Dak had been healthy the whole year Cosell doomsday 2.0 is so good that right now if they had Russell Wilson or Baker Mayfield at quarterback they'd win that's how dominant this defense <laughs> really is <I'm> sure. that's <laughs> by the way going back to Trent Dilfer you know that Ravens offense for a full month that year 2000 TJ you were really young you know they went a whole month without scoring a touchdown when they had Tony Banks and finally <laughs> Billick said hey Trent. yeah seriously they went a whole month without scoring a touchdown I think they went one and three and Brian Billick just had enough all right Trent see what you can do and his job was don't be bad enough that you screw up this historic defense. And Cooper Rush yesterday, I thought it was interesting. It seemed like he played a really good game. You know, he only threw the ball 16 times, and he was 11 for 16, didn't come within really that close of being 200 yards. So that was a very safe game plan. But that defense, really, if you get them 17 points offensively, which is very average, maybe below average at that level, you still have a shot to win. Now, guys, I have a question for you. They are going in next week, Sunday night, in the friendly city of Philadelphia for a night game. Those fans are going to be energized. They're undefeated. They're going to be rabid. They hate Dallas. Do you bring Dak Prescott in off an injury, not playing for a month under those circumstances? I mean, my view is this. If it ain't broke, why fix it now? I would play Dak because I think you're going to need him. Although, And I'm... 
I, I can't wait to see the line on this. It's probably already out. I should look. But I want to take Dallas on the money line. I think their Ooh. defense is Ooh. going to be a real problem for Philadelphia. I would play Dak because I think you're going to need a little bit more offense than what you've been getting. But I, 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 would, I would play Dak. I might stay. Again, I'm just not a huge Dak fan in general. So I yeah, think, I think he's not worth 40 some odd million. Yeah, I, I think he's a middle of the pack quarterback. I, I've said this for a while that I think he's the quarterback that makes sure you make the playoffs every year and don't get any further, right? And then so he's the guy that gets head coaches fired but keeps his job. And they paid him too much, so you're not firing him. I kind of like this is the totally different deal, but during my younger years, Kurt Warner was born out of the backup quarterback controversy. And I'm not under any illusion that Cooper Rush is going to be any sort of superstar. So is Tom Brady. And it gives people an opportunity to rally mm. around these guys. Now, those are Hall of Fame talent guys. But you see frequently that when you say, I have to play a little bit better because we don't have this guy at quarterback. I, I'm not a huge Dak fan. And if everybody else can raise their game a bit, which I think they have, I think I'd play Cooper Rush against Philly. Mm. TJ. Uh, you, you make a go you know, ahead. TJ, you make a great point. You know Tom Brady, his first Super Bowl when Mo Lewis became one of the greatest Patriots ever by knocking out Drew Bledsoe. If you look at that <laughs> year, look, he kind of Dilford his way or Brad Johnson his way to a Super Bowl. He was very safe. Um, even when they won it in two thousand three, it was relatively safe. It wasn't until the back end of his career, starting in I would say two thousand seven, which is when a guy by the name of Randy Moss came aboard that we figured out, wow, this Brady guy's a little bit better than a game manager, um, that we he really became like what I'd call a respected quarterback at that upper level. He wasn't just game managing his way to victories. You know, with Dak Prescott, it's interesting. He's either the best of the mediocre or the mediocre of the very best. And uh, there's a lot of pressure on him now. I'm with Jason. I think they are going to start Dak because if you look at the optics, he's the franchise quarterback. He's the starter. And the unwritten rule is in that league, you can't lose a job due to an injury, and you're paying him a lot. That's the reality. So he's probably going to start Sunday. Now, there is a pressure on him to win a Super Bowl or to at least win a playoff game or two. Because with that particular defense and the fact that you have a one two punch at running back that's winning and winning you some games, if he gets out and he leads this team, like you said, TJ, good enough to get you the playoff, and all he becomes is Dark Cousins, a play on Kirk Cousins, just a guy that can get you 10 to 11 wins and you're bounced out of the playoffs. <laughs> uh, Jerry Jones has an issue now. This ain't my Troy Hakeman. Uh, Danny White at least got you to the championship game three years in a row. We are now into, what, the fifth or sixth year of Dak Prescott, so it's put up or shut up. Dark, dark cousins. I kind of like that. Hey, we're going to end on a lighter note, Steve. Uh, I think it's a lighter note. I, I, this is kind of a test to just see if I'm just an old fart that uh, is, you know, yelling, get off my lawn. I'm, look, I've ripped my earring out. I probably am just an old fart at this point. Uh, but Brian Robinson, the running back for the Washington Commanders, he, he missed the first three, four weeks of the season because he got shot by a robber and Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. And uh, so yesterday when uh, the commanders introduced him uh, during player introductions, uh, he came out to 50 cents, uh, many men. Let's watch the intro. So, I, I'm old. I, it did, everybody's celebrating this. Oh, this is the greatest intro of all time. A guy nearly gets shot and killed, and we turn it into a rap video uh, where 50 Cent is rapping about, you know, his street wars and how many men tried to kill him and how he had to get revenge. I, I don't like it. Maybe I'm just an old fart, and I don't like anything. Uh, does it bother you? You got a problem with this, Kim? Jason, embrace your old fartness, because I am one too. I I'm just telling you. Remember the Muppet Show? If, if, the, if Stadler and Waldorf, those two old guys that used to just rip everything, 
were a black and an Asian guy, it'd be me and you on the balcony. In fact, we ought to do a show just like that on a balcony, <laughs> just being the peanut gallery, talking S about everything. I'm with you because here's the thing. They're treating this like he missed a month of the season because he got rear-ended and he had a back injury on the road. I, I mean, guys, he literally got carjacked and his career ended over a vehicle. And so I have a question. Would they be so blithe if this was a situation or a cop pulled him over and the worst happened? Would they be? How would this be covered? Instead, now the carjacking, oh, don't worry about it. He was good. He's good. Don't worry about it. But now, because of who was involved and what happened, they kind of played up like this is a triumphant story. But I, I, I look, I know it's not going to be popular to say, but if this was a white cop that somehow damaged Brian Robinson in a traffic stop, I get the sense the tenor of this story would not be about the triumphant return of a football player. Love that take. I may steal that and you'll get no credit for it. I, <laughs> take I love it. I, I could go ahead. That, take that's it. a great go away. That's a great take. If, if, if he had been wounded by a cop, he wouldn't, they wouldn't be having him come out to many men. Uh, they'd be talking, you know, and again, it's like, it's almost, it, TJ. Um, I'm a 31 year old old fart and I very much <laughs> hate the embrace of rap music and all that we talked about with the halftime stuff that they've come in. That, that, the part that they played, I'm looking up the lyrics, I'm, I'm not. I want to be clear. I think under my understanding in the stadium, they didn't play the lyrics. They just played the music. Got it. Over social media, someone's added the lyrics. That, that, that's what I've been told or I saw somewhere, but I'm not at any, but I don't mm. think you think your point still stands. Go ahead. Well, yeah. So the, if you've actually read the lyrics, right, um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty rough, yeah. right? The idea is everybody's trying to take me out, and yeah. if you try, you're going to find out, and one by one, right? Um, now, that, where it cut off on the social media clip was just everybody's trying to take my life away, and I'm still standing here, right? Yep. If that were actually what the song said, hey, you're okay. The idea that he's running out to, I'll take care of that guy, don't you worry. It's like, is that the culture you're trying to, <laughs> to, to put out as In the DC, NFL? Again, I know the stadium's outside of D.C., but it is Washington that represents D.C. Yeah. D.C. has a major crime problem mm -hmm. affecting black men. And we're, we're, we're celebrating this. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Jason, one last thing. If you're going to steal that, now I'm going to call you Trent Pilfer. So go ahead. It's all you, though. <laughs> I'm giving you permission. I am licensing that take. We're good. Take it. I can't wait to read it tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Great job as always. Go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Hit notifications. Hit subscribe. You can email. You know what? I'm changing this email because I've heard people complain that this email is not working. And so I'm going to change the email and I'll tell you about it tomorrow. I'm going to just come up with a Gmail account and you can email me there. Uh, but uh, the show's going to get better. Because Jason Brown, Last Chance Q, X. All right, welcome back. Time for my favorite part of Monday show, Jason Brown. No offense to you, Steve Kim. The Korean Cosell is always great, but uh, Jason Brown offers a new, different twist. Uh, let's roll out to Los Angeles and bring in Last Chance Q. Jason Brown. Jason, I saw over social media you were irate with Brandon Staley, the Chargers head coach, uh, who went for it from his side of the field with like a minute and 20 left in the game on fourth and two, got stopped, should have lost that game to the Cleveland Browns. Uh, should Brandon Staley be on a very hot seat? Man, it should be hot as fish grease. That thing right there needs to be boiling. Uh, he is, uh, he blows my mind, man. To be honest with you, uh, you know, we keep blaming these guys like Tua for the concussion uh, protocol issue. That Tua is a grown man. He has the opportunity to come out of the game or not go into the game, et cetera. And I'm like, bull crap. Because if you know the Polynesian culture at all, they are embedded in them as babies that we're going to fight, claw, scrap until the whistle blows. And that means hide a concussion, hide an injury. We're playing. 
just like we did in our generation, Jason, we played with knick-knack hurt, injuries, you know, ankles, knees. Jack Youngblood played with a broken leg. Um, you know, we, we cut fingers off back in our day, right, just to play. Um, the great safeties of the world, Ronnie Lott. So, like, this isn't the same generation, same culture, same cut from the same cloth whatsoever. You have to take the helmet away from Tua as the adult in this situation, the head coach, the general manager, whatever. Because two is going to go in. Kudos to him. We want to play. Just like I would have You know I asked you about Brandon Staley, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. So this is my point. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Staley's doing the same thing. Staley's doing the same thing. He has a team embedded in him, believing that we're going to go for it on all these fourth downs. And at some point, these players are buying into it and going to do what he says. And if he leads you down the path to a to a pond full of chloroform, they're still following him. And at some point, the leader has to say, enough is enough. We're not going for these stupid fourth down calls because it's going to cost us at the end of the day. And I'm going to be fired. And kudos to him. I've heard I've heard I've heard Eckler come on shows. We're all in, coach. We're into our coach. We go for it on fourth down. That's what we do. Well, the head coach at some point has to be a better leader and say, listen, man, this is costing us football games. And that's where I ended. I think he has to become a better leader and say, all right, enough is enough, man. This isn't high school football anymore. Minus 45 with a minute left and you're up and you don't punt the football. Come on. Analytics, Jason, are creating the worst common sense era I've ever seen in my entire life. And I, I, I just don't understand how common sense is not any longer used. And analytics is very different situation, but I do recall Bill Belichick going for it at his own 28 yard line up by six against the Colts doing a very similar thing, trying to get a first down. And he's not into analytics whatsoever. Um, Did it work? Didn't work. Mm -hmm. And they lost the game. I get it all. But I'm saying even the greatest coaches of our time here still get in these situations where they think they can. Now, I tend to think that Brandon Staley is a little more riverboat Ron, where he's just going for stuff to go for it and he thinks he's above it all. But single game stuff to put him on the hot seat to me doesn't feel right. Well, I think he struggled with this last year. Yeah, this ain't uh, single with game. Some of his decision making. Yeah. Th there's a pattern here, and he's got some of the best pieces in all of football in Justin Herbert, in Keenan Allen, who I think is banged up. Is Joey Bosa, Bosa I Keenan think, Allen now banged up? was tweeting about the call as it was happening. Who is? Keenan Allen tweeted out, WTF are we doing as, in real time as this was happening. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? There you well, go. That, that's, that's something new then because everything I've heard, Eckler, I've been at free practices. I got a few players playing there. I got a couple guys I've had on my show on the Chargers. That is a different deal then because – and it doesn't blow my mind at all that everyone's bought in except Keenan Allen, the receiver, who's the prima donna of all prima donnas, all receivers are. So I'm not saying Keenan Allen's a prima donna, but the receiving core in the football world is. So that wouldn't shock me that he's saying that. But at the same time, from what I've heard is the team is bought into Staley and his fourth down shenanigans. And maybe they've t maybe they're had enough, man. Enough is enough in a locker room of grown men. Eventually, they're going to get to you. And if you keep losing... And you're doing things that they're, they're like, man, you're costing us possible playoff opportunities like you did last year. You're costing us opportunities to continue to play and, 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 uh, and excel. They're, you're going to lose the locker room sooner than later, man. It is what it is. And that's what I see maybe could be turning that way. Uh, last night, you, you probably went to bed very pleased with yourself. Uh, Lamar Jackson <laughs> missed some big throws last night. That interception to me, you know, that, that was the chance to really put the game away and make sure, you know, there was no chance of a comeback. Uh, it was a really bad throw. And then he overthrew some guys that were running wide open. Uh, did, did Lamar Jackson get lucky last night with that victory over the Bengals? So he's like a 72% win winning player in the league as, as a starting quarterback. He's won like 70-something percent of his games. He's like one of the t highest ever. I have to ask this question, though. He has had the best offensive player 
on that roster for four years, which is a guy by the name of Buckner, their kicker. If you remove their kicker from that roster and go back and look at wins they shouldn't have got, they would not have got if it was any other kicker in football. He would not be a seventy percent winning. Justin Tucker. Tucker. Justin sorry. Tucker. You, yeah, Buck. You're thinking of name. Brinston Buckner, the defense. Yeah, I'm, I'm horrible at <laughs> yeah. names because I, I don't remember your name, Jason, unless you do something that requires it. Like if, if I don't know you, I don't really care. Like be so, the greatest kicker in the history of football. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, know, so I don't care. All I know is they got the best kicker in football ever. And without that guy, uh, Lamar Jackson don't win a lot of these games, by the way. And he got him back down there, et cetera, et cetera. Mind you, though, he was 19 of 32, 174 yards, one touchdown, one interception. And again, we talk about this every week. He had 12 carries, 12 quarterback design carries for 58 yards. And J.K. Dobbins, who's their real running back by 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 roster, he had four carries. So, again, we got a guy out here um, who I like. Look at that platform. Like, his mechanics are just uh, – Willie Anderson, great Willie Anderson. Uh, he actually is going on my Instagram right now talking about – he agrees with me because he has not changed his mechanics over the last four years. Jalen Hurts has – uh, you know, we've seen all these other quarterbacks working on changing mechanics. He has not done it. And you saw it by his two deep missed balls last night that were wide open, which he should have checked it down and went to a tight end. But we're going to throw long balls because we don't know what we're looking at. And that's just my point. I'm not here to hate on Lamar. That ball right there is a horrible thrown football. <laughs> but we're not going to mention that at all. And now that's a quarterback design run. That is a quarterback design run right there, by the way. That is speed option. And this right here is a pocket pass that, you know, I that play right there I broke down. If he don't get hit, that's an interception, by the way. But everybody on Twitter knows better. That is an interception if he does not get hit. Another quarterback design run. Jason, that's what a running back should be doing. Like, what are we doing? This is something that is just not sustainable. I say it every day, and he's oh, having. J- Jason, let me push back. Let me push back because you opened up this segment, acknowledging one thing: this guy's in year five, and his winning percentage is seventy-two percent. At some point, it can't just all be luck. And the fact that they use him in the running game and he has survived up until this point, at some point, don't we got to give him credit? But what has he survived? What, what has he won? I just keep going back to this meaningful 72% game. 72% of his games. And we have a kicker that's probably won 72% of those 72%. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to be honest with you, Jason. What does the ticker on the bottom of the clock say every time Tucker hits a game-winning field goal? It says, Lamar Jackson leads the Baltimore Ravens to victory. It doesn't say, Tucker missed the field goal and Lamar Jackson lost. No, that's what it would say if he were to lose, though, right? So we're the GOAT or the hero in this situation. To me, Lamar is either the GOAT or he's the hero. The GOAT meaning bad GOAT, not a good GOAT. He's the GOAT or the hero. If he fails to get down there and Tucker misses the kick, then then Lamar lost. But Lamar gets a lot of credit where a lot of people say I'm hating. He also gets a lot of credit where I look at it and say, you know what? He may not have 10 of these wins without Tucker. At least 10. I would say 10 is probably a low number. I mean, last year alone, this cat made six field goals in crunch time to win games. But <laughs> – I just want to. I want you to look at his passes. He threw last night for the for the second most uh, pass attempts this year. Thirty two, <laughs> thirty two in an NFL game by a quarterback is the second most by him this year. Now, if you look at the balls he's throwing, you saw a crossing route he threw to the tight end there. He threw all the deep balls yesterday he missed, and he threw that one ball that he got hit on, which had actually allowed the ball to go over the backer, or it would have been a pick. Um, you look at the balls he's throwing, just like I was watching Jalen Hurts throw yesterday, and I'm, I'm just like I'm watching Mahomes, a lot of these passes are lateral. Get it out my hand quick. Give me one destination. Nope, don't let me read a lot of coverage. Don't let me read a lot of 
rotations. Let's get it out. Boom, boom, boom. Jalen Hurts threw seven dang screens in a row yesterday I was watching. And I'm sitting there like, gosh, dang, can we throw any type of real football concept anymore? And don't even get me started on Kyler Murray. That's all he throws or he tucks it and runs. So, like, where this is my thing, though, I just did on my show this morning, Jason. We are in a dumbed-down offense. It's the worst football offense I've seen in the NFL in 30 years. If our players don't know where hot reads are, side adjusts are, if our quarterbacks don't understand protection and what we're looking for in, co- in rotation on coverage, why are we still using seven-sentence play calls by the head coach? Why is Cliff Kingsbury still using <laughs> this play call this long if our quarterback don't even know where our hot is? How about we just get up there and say, doubles right, River Houston, check with me, and let's roll. Either we got River Houston or we rotated and opposite that thing to Lake Houston. Like, it's not that hard if you got a guy that plays Fortnite all night and don't want to study and you paid him $200 million, Let's dumb it down, coaches. Like, I don't understand why coaches think they need to outsmart their players. We need to be as smart as our players are. We don't. We know we're smart. Now we don't need to outsmart and outtrick our guys. Let's get them the information as easy as possible so we can all be successful. We want to. We want to. We want a penis measure, Jason. We want to measure each other's penises, man. That's the problem. This ain't a measuring contest. This this is about getting our players the information and going fast and understanding it. This isn't a measuring contest on ego, on on how big I am, how good I am. Let's get our players the information and roll with it. I don't understand it. I, this is the most this is the worst football I've ever seen, man, in 30 years. And it's it's all over the landscape. It's college, it's pro, it's high school. It is bad. So quick aside here. Uh, did you notice Chris Collinsworth last night? Every time Lamar made a three-yard throw, look at that flick of the wrist. It was amazing. I think Chris Collinsworth is mortified of being called a racist because he was awful last night. And every time he did some great, he's like, this is the stuff nobody talks about with Lamar. This is just, look how effortless that three-yard pass was. Let me defend Chris Collinsworth slightly. I think there's tiny kernels of truth to what you're saying. But I also think you don't understand or you're overlooking, not un- don't understand, you're overlooking these television networks are paid to elevate these guys into superstars that can generate TV ratings. And so it's their job to some degree to sit there and celebrate all these guys. They're, this is the greatest thing you've ever seen. This is why like in the NBA people, the myth that LeBron James is as good as Michael Jordan persist. It's because he's, oh, he's going to catch Michael Jordan. He's yeah. going to be, and that's a reason to tune in. Oh my God, this is the greatest thing I ever saw. And they want us to believe, again, it's why no one, everybody knows what Jason Brown's talking about, what John Gruden has said. Anybody that's played any football is looking at this product, looking how soft the game is and saying, Man, I can't compare these guys to Lawrence Taylor. I can't compare these guys to Dan Marino. I can't. It's no offense to Aaron Rodgers or Brady or any of these guys, but the price of playing football has been so reduced that a 45-year-old guy can do it. <laughs> and 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 that Tom Brady, Giselle and Tom Brady would be happily married and into retirement if this dude's career had started in 1970. He would have been done with football by 1985. Giselle would be happy. They'd be grandparents and talking about how how great their life is. But because we've softened the game so much, and Tom Brady's even talked about it. He's even made the point like, man, I ain't really doing what those guys did. Mm-hmm. We've eliminated all the penalties. You can run across the middle now as a wide receiver with no fear. Yep. Alligate, no one has alligator arms anymore. You never hear it talked about because they know they're not going to get hit. So everybody tries to catch everything. Back in, and you know, you can throw guys into trouble. That was what Brady's point was. So I, I just... If any of these broadcasters were being honest, but they don't want to be called haters. If Troy Aikman got on TV and said, hey, man, I'm better than a lot of these guys. My stats may not say it, but in the era that I play, if if Lamar or any of these guys played in my era, their stats wouldn't be as good as mine. 
Collins Worth's not hyping up other people the way he did last night, though. I was actively annoyed at what he was doing with Lamar. I heard it, heard the exact same thing, and just Brady and Rodgers aren't going to be around forever, and they got to sell tickets and ratings with somebody, and they've decided Lamar is one of those guys. He does play an exciting brand of football. It does. Uh, and, it's, and so, yeah, he's telling that lie, but I hear him lie about everybody. So, and here was the main question, and this is pose a question for both you guys. I, you guys have both been on the record of saying that you would pay Lamar. JB, you said give him the bag because everybody else got the bag, whatever you said. But, and I've been strongly in the camp of don't pay this dude because I think the most likely scenario is that you hamstring yourself over the next five years. You have an MVP candidate every year that guarantees that you get 10 wins and gets bounced in the first round of the playoffs. And it makes sure that you take up 30 to 40 percent of your salary cap. You can't surround him with any good players. He's never going to have the throwing ability to get you to the playoffs. And if I, I think if the GM had any balls, you'd say, that's great for somebody else. You take your MVP candidate and win some regular season games. We're trying to win a Super Bowl here, and it ain't going to happen with Lamar. I mean, problem I mean, with I mean, that, JB, JB, I'll go first. The problem with that is they won a Super Bowl with Trent Dilfer. So they, they, they believe the they can win one of them. They the defense in the league yeah. right now, and they're not going to be able to go buy anybody because Lamar's going to take the whole cap with him. All right, JB, you go. Well, this is my uh, Matt McChesney, who's on my morning show with me, six-year NFL vet. He he said, I started the show off today with an argument of mine against Lamar. He's saying, um, if you watch the play calling for the Ravens, they have struggled in the second half of, of games all year. Last night, they scored three points. So in the last few games, they struggle in the second half of football games. And I'm sitting there listening patiently, and I said, listen, time out. What is the common denominator of this struggle in the second half? Is it play calling or is it the executor at the trigger? Because at the end of the day, the NFL defensive coordinators will figure you out. And if you watch the last five games or four games in the second half, Lamar Jackson has not only struggled mildly, they run the football much more by design with him then they throw the ball with him, and they bank on getting the ball down towards the end, get Tucker the, the win with a field goal, and play tight defense. Let's be manageable with the clock. And if you watch the second half of football games, the common denominator is Lamar Jackson. And this team, the Baltimore Ravens, are either letting him hang himself out here, leaving him out here to dry, or say, prove to us you're worth the money. Or we understand that J John Harbaugh is going to be fired. They're going to have to revamp this entire roster because they have zero wide receivers that should be playing on any other team in the NFL that should be ones or twos. They don't have a receiver in the NFL that would be playing, and not team that would be starting on any other roster in the NFL. Not one. And there's a reason for that because you can't throw the football enough, you cannot spread the wealth. And you can't get anybody other than a tight end the ball on a dang tight end pop pass. So what are we doing? Now, we either revamp this roster and you turn down your franchise tag offer and we trade you or we're done. And we're going to sign this dude and we are done for 10 years and Harbaugh's going to be fired anyway. So that's how I look at it. We, there's, a, there's a common denominator to the struggles in the second half, and it's not just play calling. Good stuff. I want to end with uh, this bigger problem. Let's spit uh, short Cam Newton. I want to move to short Cam Newton, Kyler Murray. <laughs> Who's the bigger problem in Arizona, Kyler Murray or Cliff Kingsbury? Um, it, it's like two peas in a pod. Cliff Kingsbury, number one, keeps putting the guy, keeps putting this guy that doesn't understand anything about coverage, rotation, formations, protection. He keeps putting this guy on on third and long and empty protection. And I just, it's blowing my mind. So ignorance is life threatening, A. Um, insanity by definition is keep doing the same thing over and over, expect a different result. We have all this tied in one and this guy can't get out of his own way. How about you put this guy in some 12 personnel double tight end sets where you can sprint him out, get the little cat on the run on the edge so he can number one, see, number two, become a run pass option. 
we're dropping him back in empty pass protection, expecting him to just dissect coverage. Like, come on, man. How ignorant are we? So it starts at the JB. top. Yep. JB. JB, yep. I, I'll say this. I'll guarantee you Kyler Murray is unwilling to do what you're talking about. He's not going to run around on a football field. He's too small. He's got his bag. The, the guy, he and his father are very outspoken. I guarantee you they're doing what they're allowed to do. But he's running around all day anyway. <laughs> What do you mean? He's running around the whole damn game anyway because he don't know what he's doing. He's got the baton in one hand. Let me let me let me let me end it with this. Uh, answering your question there, how about this? Baker Mayfield just got his third head coach fired. Is it a head coaching issue or is Baker Mayfield the worst quarterback in the NFL? That that's another thing you have to ask yourself. Kyler Murray's going to get Cliff Kingsbury fired, regardless of what you think or how you think about it. Just like all these players who they get this anointing paid amount of money up front, they're going to get their coach fired. And we just saw it today. Rule just got fired. And Baker's had three coaches fired. And Kyler's going to get Klingsbury fired. I mean, it's just a matter of time. I say it happens before the season ends. And I think now that Rule was the sacrificial lamb here, that's how owners operate in this league. This good old boy network's going to start rolling it down. Let's go. You're next. You're next. You're next. Now there's going to be three or four of these guys getting fired. Don't be surprised if Detroit fires their head coach because he won't fire Aaron Glenn, the D.C. So the Lions defense is atrocious. We have to start firing people as head coaches or we're going to get fired. And Clingsbury needs to figure that out. And I wouldn't be surprised if Clingsbury fires an O.C. and a D.C. here in the next couple of days just to make him look better uh, to 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 you know, so, you know, kind of elongate this, uh, evi- <laughs> the, 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 the inevitable, you're going to get fired. Um, but that's what they do, man. That's what these coaches do. They save their jobs by firing other people. And I can see Kingsbury going before this year's over. And I can see that with a lot of few others now that rules gone in, in, in Carolina and Baker's killed another coach. Baker Mayfield. I got it. Colin Cowherd was on Baker Mayfield from day one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought he was a little over the top, but man, when Cowherd nails these things, he nails them. It's like he nailed Russell Westbrook as a basketball player. And, was, and he nailed this thing. Where were you at, JB, on Baker Mayfield? Did you think it was going to work in the oh. NFL? Oh, hell no. I'm on the record. He's, been the, he's, a, he's the second most overrated quarterback of all time. I said it when he got drafted. I'm on record. I got receipts. I've been saying on my show for four years. Him and Carson Wentz are the two worst quarterbacks in the last 20 years to start in the NFL. And then now looking at it, shoot, Justin Fields, Kyler Murray, they're right there with them. And it's and it's unfortunate because Kyler Murray and Justin Fields are product of ignorance. They're putting them in too quickly. They should not be playing in the NFL right now. They just should not. Trey Lance should have never took an NFL snap at least for three years, at least. And now we're putting these cats in here year one and expecting them to get us to the ship. Come on, man. We are so ignorant nowadays at this level. The NFL has become so badly managed from top to bottom. And uh, quarterbacks should not be in. These quarterbacks should not be playing. And Baker Mayfield, I knew, was uh, was horrible from the jump. Same with Carson Wentz. I've been saying it since they were drafted. Just like I called out RG3, Vince Young, and Ryan Leaf. I've been calling them for 20 years. I ain't never missed not one. Go check it out. So Colin Cowherd can say whatever he wants. Good as mine. I bet you money. Uh, do you know who agrees with you, JB? <clears throat> Tom Brady. Did you see his press conference last week yeah. where they said, hey, have you seen all these upsets? And he said, I'm seeing a lot of bad football. All the, whatever parody you're seeing, it's just bad football. Horrible, horrible football. It ain't bad. It's horrible. It's the well, worst football I will tell I've you ever too. seen. If Cliff Kingsbury gets fired, it's because he's the one who went after Kyler Murray himself. He was the guy who said. Should've stuck with Josh Rosen? Oh, no, I wouldn't go with Josh <laughs> Rosen. But he's the guy who said, hey, if I had a chance, I might pick yeah. Kyler Murray number one overall. And he stuck with him. I guarantee you he was lobbying for this big contract to have him. He's been infatuated with the guy who was going to get him fired. I wouldn't blame Kyler. I blame Cliff for being stupid from day one. Hey, let me mm. ask you this. JB, when do you start that press conference? That's what I want to know. Because Cooper Rush, Opie, 
<laughs> is, is almost unfireable right now. When do you when do you say you know what man we got to put our big money guy back in? When do you do that? That is the most intriguing thing of all this right here because you are you're you're in, you're in a tight you're, you're you're toting the line right now with screwing Cooper Rush's career for the future because if you don't continue to play him, he's not stop the, it. He's not the next <laughs> stop player. it, JB. No, Look, Cooper not, Rush played in the MAC. I, I'm partial to MAC guys, but he's not better than Dak Prescott. Is Dak Prescott overpaid? Absolutely. But Co- he's not a, Cooper Rush is not a better quarterback than Dak Hold Prescott. On. This, is, this is where the word, the verbiage gets confused. He's not a better talent. I would say Cooper Rush is by far a better quarterback. Just remember, be careful with how we say things. Because there's a lot of verbiage out there that gets misconstrued. There is a better quarterback, and there's a better talent. Dak is a better talent. He ain't a better quarterback than Cooper Rush. I'm just telling you right now. Who gives him a better chance to win, though, JB? Cooper Rush. You know why? He don't ad-lib. He plays within the system. He doesn't turn the football over. And he's available. Every day, he's available. And when he climbs a pocket, guess what he does? He does what the quarterback definition is. Live to fight another down. He's not going to turn the football over and put us in a bad predicament. He's going to throw the football away when his clock hits three in his head. I'm Ball's gone. Boom. Because I'm a slow white dude that can't move. I know what I am. But I'm not going to turn the ball over. I'm not going to take a sack. And I'm going to do what the system tells me to do. Now, have you seen McCarthy's lost about 30 damn pounds and looks like about 400 pounds have been lifting off his shoulder? And so is Kellen Moore because this guy's buying into what they want to do and he's executing what they're doing. And there is no pressure and stress on this staff right now because they weren't supposed to win. So this dude has them living in La La Land. They're on vacation every day. See, I you believe coaches it. win games. I believe players win games. But no, we'll save that I conversation. I believe coaches lose games. Players win games. Coaching mm-hmm. is overrated. Coaching is very, very overrated. Please, I've said it for years. Coaching's overrated. Players win games. Coaches lose them. Staley should have lost him that game last night. That was a Maybe I got to go. All right, brother. I got to go. Peace. Thank you. See awesome you, job. Uh, that's tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Look for a breakout, feeling like a stand off, nothing in life, like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation. We all just want to have freedom. Sitting on a corner, never been alone. I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back. We are receiving all the seed when we all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be, I just 